there you just... go. Great. How are you, buddy? I'm very well. Thank you. Good, good. good. I got glad. in, Tony. Glad, awful glad to see you here. Thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. You're gonna, you're gonna, you, you can stick around. We're gonna, we're gonna go through a bunch of like local business and stuff, and then we'll, we'll introduce you and, and you can tell, you can talk about all the stuff you do and how we know each other and the arguments we've had and whatever. So. <laughs> I hope that's a martini glass that you have in front of you. It is absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's the drink of choice down here. When I'm up north, it's, when I'm up north, it's bourbon, but down here it's definitely a martini. Tom, oh, perfect. Tom, Tom. Yes, sir. Do a 30-second recap for the for the benefit of the people that just got in the room. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I get I, I gotta figure out. I mean, in fact, let me let me check on something here. And I'm going to disable the waiting room so people can just bop in there. That was a mistake on my part. All right, so uh, we were talking about our fundraiser that's going on right now. And it launched Monday, uh, all online, um, promoting it on Facebook. We've been promoting it. You know, I've been sending emails to our mailing list of 400 plus. Um, on the Facebook side, it looks as though we're getting traction among um, a people and a couple of the ads that we've run, we've got better of a thousand or more people that I think that they call it engagement. And so I think that means they've actually clicked on the site and looked at stuff. And, um, but it's not translating into money as yet. Um, you know, we have, I, I can't, I don't have the numbers exactly in front of me, but um, it's probably north about $3,500. So on the auction side, we've hit about 16% of our target. We're about 9% on the raffle side. Um, you know, lots of great equipment, lots of great guides that, you know, are, are offering their services, a lot of great artwork and, you know, specialty kinds of things. So it's been kind of disappointing in the kind of coverage that we've been getting so far. Um, but it's early. And as Andre pointed out earlier, is that you know, a lot of people go into these things really late in the game uh, to try to make a hit and, and win what they got to do. But we really need our membership, everyone I've been tapping into, to help share what we're doing for a, a couple of really good causes. Of course, you know, we're, we're here to support the, the scholarship fund at Florida Gulf Coast University's Water School. You know, it's a, it's a new institution. It's got some really good, you know, uh, upperclassmen and, and, um, and graduate students that are working and solving our serious water problems here in Southwest Florida. And we've got to take it to the next step and, you know, raise as much as we can to support those scholarships. We've got through some amazing, amazingly generous uh, donors, um, better than a quarter million dollars in this endowment. And this is like a year into the game. So it, it's just a phenomenal thing that, that, is, that has happened. Um, and, and we're not a, actually not, we're, we're a big piece in terms of promoting it, but we're not a big piece in terms of funding it. And we'll, we'll talk sometime later about, you know, how we, we keep to engage, you know, people that are likely to support this effort to, to make a difference in, in establishing um, uh, the, the science and everything else to really solve the clean water problem with red tide and everything else going here in Southwest Florida, Lake Okeechobee and the water releases and the politics of it. You know, Captains for Clean Water is certainly a big part of that. Um, but there are other organizations too that we need to partner with. They're, you know, they're, they're all working on the same side, even if they don't work it from the same angle. So we, you know, we find, have to find a way to engage in all of that. Um, plus, of course, we support you know, some local online on island organizations like uh, the Santa Bel Captiva Conservation Foundation, which now uh, owns the Sea School here, which is a great resource to bring young people into the whole environmental issue. Um, you know, just you know, a lot of stuff to do and, and, and they all need money. And this is a terrible year to raise money in, but 
you know, every 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 hand on deck that we can get is is uh, to our benefit. Um, in that regard, with um, the university, uh, both the director of development, June Stein, and the executive director of the the water school that I keep in constant contact with, have also broadcast this the auction and the raffle to the interested parties um, of the water school. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for following up on that. Um, as, as I reiterate, I'll reiterate what I told some of the folks online earlier, beginning tomorrow in the Cape Coral and Naples papers, uh, we'll have ads and that those will run tomorrow, Sunday and Wednesday. Uh, we're also in their online component right through the 19th when our, when our event ends. Um, and they will run something equivalent to a slideshow of all the art and guides and everything else to <laughs> entice people to, to, to play. So, uh, and then next week in the, in the Sanibel paper, there'll be a full page ad about, about what we're doing as well. So, um, and then I've got, I've engaged um, Fly Fishers International, which of course everyone knows we're a chapter of, and the Florida, regional FFI uh, group to promote what we're doing as well. So uh, we've reached out to a couple local groups. Um, we've reached out to the Florida Saltwater Flishing Group on Facebook, who has uh, decided that, that they support what we're doing. Um, so, that, so we can run some more ads there. Um, I did run um, some stuff by the Naples um, FFI club, uh, backwater, back, backwater, back country or something back country like fly fishers. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're the Naples FFI chapter, but, um, um, and they, and they're, they're in the same boat we are, but, um, uh, so they're, they're, they're being helpful. Um, but it just, you know, hopefully it'll translate into some traction, uh, relatively soon. So, um, I just encourage everybody to send everything to everybody that, that you hear about. And I'll send out some more emails about this uh, in, in the coming days too, so. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. All right, Pete, do you wanna take control here? Sure. Oh, by the way, by the way, um, Ray, we've got a couple of Michiganders here besides me. Oh. <laughs> um, right. So uh, Ray Schmidt is gonna be our speaker tonight. He's a, he's a great guy and a friend of mine from, from, from uh, for a number of years. Um, Bob DeVore, who's on our board, he's, uh, my, he's on my fire right, and I have no idea where he appears to you. Um, he's from Indian River. Oh, he's a really? neighbor of yours. Yeah, he grew Good up there. Ray grew up in, uh, Ray, uh, Ray was born in Ottawa. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> we, we played Ottawa in basketball. There you go. You guys might have known each other. Who knows? And then, uh, and then our, our president, Pete Squibb, um, he's from Michigan. He was with the DNR for, for decades. Okay. So, and, and uh, he's down here. He's the guy that collects all our numbers for us. He fishes virtually every day and sends all the data to Florida and pisses them off. So, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's kind of awesome. <laughs> we got some great, great, great people here. Oh, cool. All right, Pete, I'll, I'll, I'll let you start. Okay, well, we had, I, I just want to talk about a couple things, but you've already covered part of it with the, the membership update. It looks like we're up, what, 60-some members now, paid members? We are, we are 67 members down from 114 last year. Okay, you know, they're, that's they're, up from they're, like 50 a month ago or so. 50-something, um, yeah. So, yeah. We, you know, they keep trickling in, mostly online, but yeah. Okay, and I assume we do have some money in our accounts yet. Um, we do. Um, we're spending um, some marketing money. Yep. Um, but we're getting donations, and I don't have, I don't have all of it. But uh, I've recorded. Um, so just for the club, um, since the first of the year, I've recorded about thirteen hundred eighty-five dollars just for the club donation, right. and um, almost two thousand dollars for the for the uh, the scholarship fund. Now that doesn't include stuff that's coming in from the auction or raffle yet, um, but it, it's it's everything else that we we've gotten. So we're 
we're up about four grand, okay. which is not bad. Right. Yep. Okay. That's good. Well, I got a, I got a couple small things <clears throat> that I want to talk about. Then we'll get into a fishing report, which Ray may find interesting if, cause I think there's, oh, there must be at least half a dozen other guys here that are on tonight that have, that have been fishing that I can see. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do enlist some folks on anybody that's going to be here this summer, uh, particularly in July, I made a commitment to Sandbell Sea School. They have a um, summer classroom that's a, it's a summer camp that's a, a week long and it runs that week of the 28th. And they wanted to take one day and have that for fly fishing, fly tying and fly fishing. And there'll be probably 15 students involved in it by the look, 12 to 15, which is a good number. But I'm gonna be back at that time. I'll be here at that time. So I'm planning to be involved, but anybody else that's a full-time resident that's gonna be here that last week of July, we're committed, I've committed for Wednesday, the 28th of July, that we will host and, and Sanibel Fly Fishers will kind of head up a, their, their um, learning package for that day. And we're gonna break it into two segments. One will be fly tying, and one will actually be fly instruction and actually some time on the water if we could fit it in. So I think we got probably between what I can see on my screen here, we've got enough people, if they participate, that can teach kids at least some introductory fly casting and some fly tying. And I think we can do that simple. We've got enough vices, we've got enough materials that the club owns. We've got enough of us that have got materials that we can, we can probably get it together and, and have something really good going for them by July 28th. But I wanna put a heads up out there now for anybody, particularly on the board, anybody at the meeting tonight, to mark your calendar. If you're gonna be here in, in July, I'd sure like to have you participate in this because I don't think we can have too many people. I'd rather have more of our people there than students if we can work it that way. So again, July 28th, and it'll be at the Bailey Homestead. So it'll be kind of out of the way and good place to be. Um, one other thing I want to talk about just briefly one thing Tom didn't mention to this group is that he's going to be making a presentation or he's not going to be making a presentation. He's going to be hosting or co-hosting with Debbie Hansen on Real Talk Radio um, on 93 Saturday point, morning. 90, yeah, 93.5 FM. Yep, yep, you can pick it up. It's the, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it's got a wide a, a wide listening audience across Florida and particularly the south half of the state. And it's been on going for what, 16, 17 years now. She's been the host for the last two years. She does a really good job. As most of you know, she's a guide and her husband's a guide. He guides saltwater, she guides freshwater. They have a pretty intimate knowledge of what's going on around here. And she's pretty supportive of, of our thought processes also. But he's going to be on there for three hours Saturday morning starting at seven and talking about our auction and just life in general as a fly fisherman in southwest Florida. And getting to, to, to share some ideas with Debbie who is from Indiana but grew up fishing with her grandfather in Northern Michigan. So she spent a lot of time, she's familiar with Michigan. She's got a soft spot in her heart for Michigan. So that'll be a, a good venture for us. Um, the other thing is that I mentioned in the last couple of meetings um, and I really wanna thank everybody who put in comments to FWC this last month on the rules and regs for the closure area for snook, redfish, and sea trout. Uh, they're just finishing up their third workshop tonight. Um, they had one for the uh, 
our area, which was the south half of, of the area from Sarasota South. They had two that were for the area north from, from uh, Tampa Bay down and then in there. Uh, they're taking more input, but uh, a week ago today, uh, there was a small group of us met with, and I'm only gonna give you a little bit of this, but I, what I want you to gather from it is there's some real positive things happening with FWC that I didn't think would happen. I'm thrilled to death that it is. But we met with a, one of the commissioners who has been charged to come up with the short-term management direction for this area, which is from Tampa Bay to Naples, basically. Um, once the executive order expires in May 31st of this year. And he is very, they, FWC has got a tremendous amount of input on this topic, um, starting at their, at their uh, February, their March meeting. They're going to re make recommendations on how to go with recommendations after the order expires on May 31st. That'll be done at their May meeting. Where they're leaning right now, is, and I can tell you a couple things. One, there's, they realize that there's a big difference in what the anglers and the guides fishing in this entire area are seeing and what their FWC research data shows. Shows a big, a big gap, a negative gap of fish that aren't there. This is more dramatic for the area in the south, our area, where it's been impacted by red tide the heaviest over this, this last couple of years. Uh, there's a big discrepancy and the comments that they have, they recognize that and they recognize it to the point where they are looking at a couple options. And what they're basically looking at is separating out the south half of this area, which would be somewhere from Charlotte Harbor or Sarasota south to Naples, wherever down there. We've got to come up with some points. And looking at that as needing a different way to look at the data and data needs within that area because it is influenced by the Clusahatchee River and discharges into the Peace River from all the phosphate mining to the north. And they recognize that this area has probably 80% of the red tide problems in the state are within that zone from Sarasota to Naples. So they realize that there's something there and that does impact the fisheries. And this last red tide in, uh, event impacted it very dramatically. It has recovered somewhat, but they realize that it hasn't recovered as much as it should have and as much as their data shows. Pete, what you, you said there's a difference between what the department uh, perceives and what the, the fishing uh, community perceives. What is that in our area? What, what, their what they, and you have to realize how they do their collections and their data. For each of these species, for sea trout, for redfish and snook, their management unit is the entire Gulf of Mexico. Okay, and so what, when they do their surveys, and when you know statistical stuff and variations, you know, there's things called confidence limits and variations. And in something like this, and when I was dealing with it, when you're dealing with wild animals that are tougher to crawl up than numbers in a box type deal, like uh, other researchers have, the confidence limits can be very broad. They can be, in this case, they might be 30, 35%, which means if they say the population is at this level, it could be 30 or 35% more or 30 or 35% less. But 95% of the time, it's gonna fall within those two sets from 
more to 35% less. What that does is if you have an area that's impacted by these non-controllable situations like red tide or winter kills or some other impacts, heavy development, you can have a spot or a chunk of that area where you can see depressed populations if you're out there on the ground, but it isn't measurable with the, the scale that they do their research uh, finding, their, their research sampling. There, so what they're- it's, it's their aggregation of all that data. Right. And right. they're it, short, the short, the bottom line is, is that they're coming back and they're saying, that from their perspective, their data shows no overall long-term impacts on sea trout, redfish, or snook within the Gulf of Mexico caused by red tide. Okay, and that's basically what the researchers are, have brought forward. And you can read that how you want, but, but what that does is that creates a big credibility gap with people in our area who can see that the fish have not come back. And so we, anyway, we, we had a meeting with, with the director who is charged with, with coming up with the short-term regulations in the short term. And what it looks like they're gonna support at this stage of the game is opening up everything in the north half of that unit, letting the, the uh, uh, executive order expire, which would then let all the other regulations for snook, trout, and redfish in the northern area take place starting May 31st of this year. You're but they are look, considering two options for the south half from Sarasota to Naples, and that would be keeping snook, redfish, and sea trout all three closed for another full year. And that would have to be under another executive order. That option is pretty realistic, but it's a tougher one to sell because sea trout have made a, a, a rebound better than any of the other species. And there, there is a demand, more of a demand for people who want to take sea trout home. The second option for that would be closing snook and redfish for another year and opening sea trout, but under an executive order which would allow one fish a day per person or six per boat, which would be a boat limit, which is the first time they've even thought about that, and no fish kept over 20 inches. So that is one that is people could live with. Um, I personally, I could live with that, but I'd rather see it closed just from the philosophical standpoint of emphasizing that uh, people fish for more than just taking meat home for the, for the dinner table. But um, they're working that through. But another piece that's really important and that what we've been pushing is to get the FWC to realize that this is a different area and within the next year, come up with a set of parameters for measuring populations and setting up regulations for this smaller area, taking it out of the entire Gulf of Mexico. And that is a major, major step for them to do. It's gonna take a lot, of, a lot of steps for that to happen, but it looks like that may may take place. I'll be able to talk to you more about it. We'll send a note out probably by the end of this month as to where it goes, but um, I'll be hearing some more about it tomorrow after tonight is their last meeting of these three workshops. So it's, it's from my perspective as an agency person that used to work on the agency, it's very positive, but I know the intricacies of trying to get an agency who has never thought outside of a box to change and what it what it requires to make those changes happen but it looks like we're on that road and we're about two steps away from it and it was probably one of the most positive meetings i've held with anything in a, any capacity with natural resources 
other than the one I had with the uh, Humane Society of the United States in Michigan that allowed us to, to remove goose eggs in the Detroit metro area. <laughs> so anyway, it is, it's positive. I think it'll work. Um, so with that, let's go on. That line. And I'd like to take it. It's, yeah, it's 630. We got a few minutes. Let's talk about the fishing. What's, what's everybody been seeing for fishing out here the last two, three weeks since the last meeting? Well, I, uh, as, you, as you know, Pete, I've had some pretty good success up along the West Gulf beaches, but I'll say that within the last week, it's, uh, it's you know, it's been really difficult. I haven't, a lot of days I haven't seen a fish. I haven't seen bait fish. I hadn't seen birds. Uh, a lot of bikinis on the beach, but uh, nothing that I can uh, throw a fly at. <laughs> good. Gary's been out quite a bit too. Chris and I were out yesterday and I'll, I'll let him talk about that. We, we did, we got some trout, but I, Pete, I wanted to let you know that I got a picture today of a 42 inch snook that a guy caught and clammed by you down by where they put the kayaks in down at, on Bowman's beach, a little, that platform down there. He got it fishing from the beach, 42 inch snook. I in think the he was bayou? just rubbing my nose. He was rubbing my nose in it, is what he was. Yeah, doing, I was fishing I was... there this morning. Now, did you catch did you catch that 42 inch snook too? No, I or? got one that was 14 though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of the big fish had moved out of there, but he evidently got yeah. in. He, in he got one. He got, that, yep. He got one. Yeah. Does he fish down there pretty regularly? No, he's he's a seasonal guy that just comes okay. in for a few weeks. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. there's a guy that I've run into down there, and and he's been fishing on that dock pretty regularly here for the last two weeks. And I wonder if that was him. I, I don't usually get that far down there in my kayak, but I, I'm beginning to get motivated now. No, that's okay. You don't need to stay up there with those gators. <laughs> yeah, we've got a big we got a big gator out here, boy. I'll tell you, he's very I know, impressive. I know. <laughs> he's very impressive. How about Chris Coyle? You're on you're, mute. You're muted. You're muted, Chris. I'm gonna get a T-shirt that says that you're <laughs> muted. You're muted. Unmute yourself. Yeah. Not yet. You're still Not muted. Yet. <clears throat> Keep trying, Chris. We'll let's. Um... So we'll talk about we'll talk about gators first. There, there we go. There, there we go. There, there, we go. there he is. Never mind. There you go. It was complicated. I had to hit the button that said unmute. <laughs> yeah, right. Anyway, um, it's like trying to sign up for a vaccination. No, yeah. Nowhere yeah. near as uh, often as I normally would, but we've had really pretty good luck on the, on the other side of Pine Island Sound and, uh, and the areas that we normally fish through, kind of Blind Pass, Key, and uh, all that area has been very, very marginal. Tons of guides. Uh, we'll smother the pass. And when we had that uh, cold front, um, they were catching, um, what do you call it? Uh, they caught a million they have stripes on them all over the place. Sheep's head. Sheep's head. Sheep's head Sheep yeah. around, Sheep 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 around the docks, yeah. Off my dock, my and you can pass. keep those. You can, you can. <laughs> yeah. that's one you can keep. Right. That's it. We actually called one on the fly the other day, which was yep. not frequent for me, I'm sure. But trout, I'd say in the normal places, anytime you have a drop off <clears throat> where you've had a big flat of like two or three feet and it drops off abruptly into a four foot flat, that's a good place. And typically we'll hold so, so uh, St. James City, I've grown up and fished up in those canals and done okay catching smaller uh, snook and uh, lots of snapper. So there's always something going on in these big windy days. So um, I would say it's 
not been anywhere near as good as it's been in prior years. Uh, but again, I, I was late in giving up on certain areas and moving and exploring new areas because there are fish around, but they're not necessarily where they've been for years. Right, right. Good, Chris. Anybody else that's been out fishing? Gary, any of you guys that? Yeah, this is Gary in Ternicola. Uh, about three weeks ago, um, just down the road from Tony uh, on West Gulf, uh, east of uh, Tarpon Bay Beach. And we had one day where there were a lot of schnook just running the beach. Um, I was able to catch one, but it was really lethargic. Hmm. It uh, is about, I'd say, 32 inches long. And it it took my fly and, you know, ran about 20 feet, did one jump and then just didn't move much. And it had a big, um, like, uh, tumor or something on its lips. So I was really concerned about that. I don't know if anybody's seen that kind of thing out there uh, elsewhere, but it, it was concerning. Yes. I got, I got a 34 inch fish early this week that had a big tumor on the side yeah. and then also one on the, on the lip, which uh, this Here's first time I've run of, into those uh, things. Of that one. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, but it had no energy in it. It was mm. like pulling in a log. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But there are a lot of them out there. And I saw a nice big redfish caught yesterday on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> yep. How about anybody else? But uh, let's have some, let's have some, what, what flies are people using? <laughs> Black and orange. Okay. I know, I know that's what Pete's using. I've Gary? just been using Norm Schmino. <laughs> Gary, what are you using? Like a, like a small Schmino, like a, a smaller Schmino. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I've been, I've been fishing all over trying to keep up on fish and find them. And with the wind changing and the water quality, it's been a bear this last four weeks since I've been back into the mode of, of fishing. But it, it, was, it was good early. Mm -hmm. uh, we were starting to see good numbers of fish, snook on the beach. Um, Rene Ramos, if you guys know Rene, he and I fished together quite a bit. We caught a, a we probably got 15 fish, 32 to 40 inches, almost just short of 40 inches in that first couple of weeks. Um, but it's it's gone downhill since then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there were some big red fish. I got a 35 inch red off the rocks um, Sunday. Um, but I mean, accidental type stuff, nothing yeah. cast into, but but there are fish, but it's real variable and they're there when there's bait and the bait has been, uh, that water in the Gulf has been moving up and down and it's, it's marginal for those snook right now. Yeah. Um, and I think personally, I think what we've been seeing, which I, is what we usually see every year in, in March and early April is there's a lot of these big fish that are there but you never see them as dark fish. They're always silver fish and they're in groups together. And I, I think personally, those are the fish that FWC has identified is that when they spawn, there's fish that move offshore and never come back into the backwater. They stay offshore. They're the ones that the guides are picking up off of the wrecks and the inshore reefs in, in, in uh, you know, inshore type areas. And I think as that water starts to warm and start pushing above 70 degrees, those fish just naturally start moving in with that water um, thermocline and start moving into the beach. And you see them early. They're, they're really hungry at that time. They eat really well, but then they disappear. And then they'll show up again in another, around the middle of May, There's there'll be good numbers again. But it's an interesting phenomenon that I've noticed over the last seven or eight years. But, but there are fish, but boy, if you try to go out and say, I'm gonna go catch a snook today, 
and pick one place, be prepared to be oh. hanging your head and taking your hat home empty because there's a lot of places with no fish on them right now. If there's no bait, you're not gonna find fish. So, yeah. Uh, that's all I have at this stage of the game. Tom, how would you like to do an introduction and introduce the speaker and let's see where we can go with that. Absolutely. So Ray and I, Ray Schmidt and I have known each other for a number of years. Um, he and his wife, Kate, um, run a business in Northern Michigan called Double S Outfitters. Um, and they have a little fly shop and they have a, a, a tourist cabin that they, that they, that they run and uh, guiding service that they've had in the past and known now, I think mostly for your travel stuff that you do. Um, I fished with Ray in Belize. I fished with him in Chile. He uh, hosts trips to Alaska, to uh, Argentina. Um, and so he's been, he's been the world traveler. Wonderful guy, uh, wonderful couple, Ray's a couple beagles. <laughs> um does he's he's, he's a uh, fly innovator he's developed so many local patterns for northern michigan steelhead and trout that that they're innumerable uh you can go on his website and find uh links to uh to tie uh, fly tying videos for all those patterns um he's from Ottawa, little town on uh, on the shores of black lake michigan and uh, as we pointed out early in in the in the in the in the meeting uh, there's a couple local compatriots that that know that area really well. So, Ray, if I missed anything, fill it in, and uh, I'll let you go. <laughs> well, thanks, Thomas, and uh, congratulations, you guys, on your 10th anniversary. It uh, looks like uh, you got some stuff going on there that is not too unfamiliar. <laughs> to most conservation clubs, you know, around the Great Lakes and around the country. Uh, you, you know, we're, times, times have changed and, uh, you know, watersheds have, have changed and, and uh, you know, I, I see it virtually all over the world. Uh, some places are more heavily impacted than others. Uh, I know that this red tide business for you guys has been you know, devastating, and uh, you know it's that it's a tough uphill battle. I I completely understand. So, just uh, to give you a little little bit of background uh, about us, and I started saltwater fishing uh, about 1985 when one of my uh, really wealthy clients uh, wanted to go explore Belize and I'd been his guide for many years. And, you know, he was, he hauled my butt to a lot of places that I could never have afforded. Um, and uh, so my saltwater uh, years have clicked away and I've, probably spent more time in Belize than any other place. I've fished Florida and the Florida Keys and the Bahamas, but probably spent more time in Belize than, than any place else because I'd, I'd met so many folks there that run various uh, lodges and guide operations uh, throughout the country. I've, I've fished it from Punta Gorda uh, on the Guatemala border uh, all the way to Mexico uh, and pretty much every, every place in between. Belize is probably not a hell of a lot different than what you're experiencing in Florida uh, with population increases of people, uh, resorts, and what comes along with that, as you guys know, is you know too damn many people in too small a place uh, you know, you can say too much boat traffic, uh, pollution that's going into the sea and all of those things that you wouldn't think about when you're thinking about, you know, Northern Guatemala or Belize or Southern Mexico, it exists pretty much everywhere. Uh, so, you know, I, I am certainly no, uh, absolute expert, uh, like 
like some of you guys that have lived your life on salt, but I've spent a hell of a lot of time on the deck of a skiff uh, with all of its victories and heartbreaks, as you guys well know. And I, uh, I think I've done a pretty good job. I've got tarpon, I've got bonefish, I've got permit, I've got barracuda and snook and, you know, all of the, the really cool fish uh, over the years. And it's, it's been a joy. And, you know, so being a, a fly tire and a fly designer, I worked a lot of years for Umqua as one of their, you know, fly designers. And I did a lot of stuff for those guys, mostly uh, Michigan uh, patterns, not only for trout, but for steelhead and and uh, learned a lot along the way from a lot of great fly tires and innovators. And so I incorporated a lot of those in my fly, in my fly patterns for salt uh, and uh, have been very successful with them. And, and so it's, it's all been good. These days, uh, I own a company called Schmidt Outfitters. I started that in 1977 and got a really great offer uh, in 2012 uh, for that business. And so my wife and I sold it and uh, our intentions was to retire uh, or semi-retire. I was a pretty young guy at that time. I was 64. And uh, if, if 64 is young, you know, you know how it goes. It's all relative, right? Uh, but uh, one of my best friends uh, was, was a guy by the name of Rick Pope. Maybe you guys know him. He he started and owned TFO, Temple Fork Outfitters. And mm -hmm. Rick invited us down to uh, for a visit. And I left there with a J-O-B. So we came back home and we managed the sales and marketing for Rick and TFO throughout the Great Lakes region for six years. And we just retired last October. And uh, I was still feeling pretty young. And, and so I went back in the guide boat a couple of days a week. And I've, I've continued to do that uh, as well as run our little online fly shop and the cottage that we built for our guests and friends and that sort of stuff. So that's, that's kind of been my, uh, my life. I've, you know, I was fortunate uh, as, as a young lad, uh, my eldest uh, brother-in-law was a fly angler and a fly tire and I didn't know it then uh, but my uncle who was a grayling conservation officer was a really famous fly angler and fly tire by the name of Clarence Roberts and uh, so my mother is Clarence's eldest sister she's the eldest of the Roberts clan uh, they're all gone now of course but uh I used to visit Clarence every summer for a couple of weeks. I had a brother, elder brother that lived in Grayling. And uh, I used to visit Clarence on his Thursday night basement fly tying bullshit sessions uh, with him and a bunch of other really now we all know famous guys. Fred Bear was part of that. And guys, uh, uh, Earl Madsen was part of that. And these are all really famous historical Michigan fly tires that uh, I had a chance to be around when I was a young kid, uh, probably 11, 12, 13, somewhere in that range. Clarence took a shine to me because, uh, you know, my father, uh, he was a guy that if it was brown, it's down kind of guy. So there was not a hell of a lot of conservation in our farm family, uh, you know, because, you know, venison was something you just did to put in a damn freezer to feed the family. And so anyway, uh, Clarence wasn't really happy about my dad or anything that went on in the Schmidt household. But he took a shine to me because I love fly fishing and uh, fly tying. And uh, so we, you know, he's gone now as well and retired from the DNR uh, mid fifties. Uh, he had heart conditions, moved to Florida uh, and lived the balance of his life there happily. And uh, uh, so anyway, that's kind of my background. Onaway, as you know, the, who was from Onaway on the, in the group or from Indian River? 
Bob DeVore. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, you know, we were neighbors up there and uh, the black and the pigeon uh, and Milligan Creek, all of those great brook trout streams uh, right in the neighborhood. So we had plenty of fishing in that territory. So, you know, uh, that's, that's a little bit about myself and uh, Thomas, I, you know, I don't know um, if you wanted me to, to share some information about Belize, uh, some destinations, some fly patterns, all of those things uh, that I've come to know in the last 25 or 30 years. If, if that's of interest to you folks, um, certainly I, I, I have all of that information at hand if you, know, if you folks would like to, to, to learn about it or hear about it. Maybe some of you have been there and done that. I know Thomas has, he went with us one year. We had a great time. We've took over the years, uh, I guess at this point, probably hundreds of people there. Well, Ray, I, I, you know, I, I, I suggest that you share um, all your experience with Belize and what you know best about that, because it's probably what's most familiar to most of our guys. Um, and some of us, of course, aspire to go to Belize. So um, that would be great. Well, I, I would say this right up front. Uh, if you have any inspirations to do that do it sooner than later because it is also growing very quickly there uh, you know for example uh, San Pedro on the which is a once was a fishing village uh, on the island of Ambergris Cay uh, when I first started going there there was about 1900 people on the island and now it's 10 times that uh, with some, you know, big resort hotels on the beach with, you know, that's everywhere these days. And, you know, I've, I've spoke a lot with the guides there in the last year since the COVID pandemic hit. And they say fishing is as good as it ever was because there hasn't been the pressure put on the fish. My last visit there was three years ago and I had never seen so much pressure uh, so many guide boats, uh, so many private boats that were out on the flats uh, hunting, uh, you know, tarpon and uh, bonefish and things of that nature. Belize is easy to get to and it's relatively inexpensive to get to. Uh, fly into Belize City, Belize. Uh, you know, it's a two hour flight from Miami or from Houston or Dallas. Uh, New Orleans, uh, those are all connection points. They probably have five or six uh, flights a day that goes into Belize City. Last count, we were, we were looking at around 400 bucks round trip out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. And that's a hell of a good deal uh, it, when you really take a look at it. Once you arrive there, uh, you jump on the... Uh, small airlines or you can take a ferry to any of the islands or you can take a bus if you're going down to uh, Placencia for example or if you're going to Punta Gorda it's a hell of a long ride but you can take a bus but most people fly because it's cheap a couple airlines serve that area um, uh, Maya Airlines Maya Island Air is one and then the other is Tropic Air and they leave those airports, you know, half an hour flights all day long, you know, you know, so, you know, we see a lot of people panicked at the airport when they come in late, uh, you know, from a flight from the U.S. wondering, oh, shit, I've missed my flight to the island. Well, truth of the matter is 15 minutes later, there's another flight going. So it's, it's just not a big deal. And it's cheap. Uh, usually the lodges We'll have somebody, they'll meet you at the airport, pick you up and your luggage, and you know, you'll head off to hither, skither, and yon, wherever you happen to be going. Popular, uh, popular spots are uh, Key Cocker and Ambergris K because they're inside the reef and they are fairly close to the mainland. So there's a lot of protection of wind uh, in some of the back bays and, uh, and the reef itself, uh, offers a lot of protection there. Permit numbers are, 
are as good as any place I've ever fished permit. Um, they're not always monsters, but there's always a lot of them. And, you know, I say any permit on a fly is a pretty damn nice permit. I went for a lot of years uh, claiming that I had caught four and a half permit and the, uh, the half part was eaten by another fish as I was, you know, fighting it to bring it in. But uh, there's a lot of permits still in Belize and, you know, shrimp patterns and crab patterns there are just, you know, same everywhere, right? That's what they eat. Tarpon, um, the resident tarpon there are, you know, that's, that's, it, it's a it's a fish factory for tarpon with all the mangrove and inland bays that they have there. The baby tarpon are a big thing. Uh, the mangrove babies are, you know, eight to 10 pounds. Uh, they don't really leave that protection as you guys probably are well aware until they get into that size range and move out onto the flats. Their residents there will range anywhere from 20 to 25 pounds up to the biggest tarpon I've taken there is 80 pounds. They do have a migration there of big fish uh, that generally happens uh, in the month of May and early June, probably not much different than what you folks see in the Keys, you know, that I've, you know, I've been in Key Largo and watched that train of big fish come down the coast uh, as you wave goodbye to them with their, you know, with their tails on fire and chasing them and throwing flies. But uh, the, the big fish there show up at that time of the year. They hang around for a couple months before they scoot out of there. Whether they're coming there to spawn, you know, the, the data on, on tarpon and where they spawn and all of that is some some well known, but uh, others not so much. And that's certainly the case in Belize. What they have done there, uh, which I was a big supporter of and gathered a whole lot of folks from the United States to uh, voice their opinions is no kill on the big three, tarpon, bonefish and permit. So there, that that flew uh, in the face of even the Belize government, which is, you know, one of the most corrupt bunch of yahoos I've ever been around. Um, but that's the case these days, except for poaching. Of course, that's always going to go on. And that really helped the population. It, it increased the overall size of the bonefish, I can tell you that. And a big bonefish in Belize is five pounds. Uh, it's, you know, it's not like the, the monsters we see in the Bahamas or the Keys or, uh, so, you know, these days it's not uncommon to, to get a three, three and a half, four pound bonefish, uh, you know, and there's plenty of them. Uh, so that's, that's a cool thing. And I would say, uh, if I were going for my first time to Belize, I would probably go to either Key Cocker or Ambergris K. Ambergris hosts um, and boasts, I think now four lodge slash outfitters. Uh, the old standby um, El Pescador on the, on the north side of the uh, island split. Uh, on the south end uh, is Blue Bonefish. That's relatively new within the last 10 years. Um, Tres Pescado in right in town is an outfitter. And uh, Lorianne Murphy, some of you may know Lorianne from her Western uh, Real Women uh, group, now lives in Belize and she has an outfitting company there as well. And she's a damn good guide and she's got a good guide staff. I can attest to that. I've been out with her and been out with a couple of her guides. So there's, there's options there. Uh, if you're going on, on a full blown, you know, lodging food guides and want the best, it's going to be El Pescador without question. Uh, the food, the accommodations, customer service there is, extraordinary. 
probably next in line to that would be blue bonefish, which has new owners and uh, they've refurbed that whole uh, lodge atmosphere, added a lot of things to it. Some did, Johnson, lot, did Johnson sell that? They did. Okay. They sold it, uh, oh, let's see, it was a year ago, January, they sold blue bonefish. And the new folks bought the property right next to it, Thomas, uh, south and built a lodge right there in the incoming driveway and uh so it's it's a cool it's it's a cool place um jim and phyllis still live there they live on the bay uh, you know across the road uh in the winter time and then they run their operations in alaska they've got a couple operations uh on the knack knack in alaska uh, Lori Ann doesn't have lodging or meals or anything like that, but uh, you know, there's many cabanas there that you can rent along the beach or even off the beach for if you're looking for a, a price. Um, and same with Trace Pescados, uh, they don't have lodging, but they do have guides and they have lodging accommodations and all of that sort of stuff. So that it's pretty easy to navigate. Now it's not quite so easy on K Cocker. There's only a couple places on K Cocker, um, but it's, it's a more laid back atmosphere on K Cocker. We actually like it over there. And uh, some of the guys from uh, Ambergris, you know, it's only maybe a 15 minute boat ride out to K Cocker from Ambergris. So it's, it's, it's a pretty cool place to fish. And we go over there a lot anyway uh, to fish the east side of K Cocker uh, for snook. Uh, there's a lot of snook that, that run the mangroves there in that shoreline. So that's, that's kind of cool. When, uh, when I was there with you about five or six years ago, there were some uh, guide labor issues that were being resolved with, between the government and lodges and stuff like that. How has that worked out? You know, I think, uh, I think all of that has worked out really well. Kate and I actually went there, Thomas, right after that, um, uh, Allie at El Pescador hired us as consultants and uh, we went down and jumped into that fray. Well, that was a really stupid thing for us. To do. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we pissed off a lot of people. We made very few friends, but pissed off many. Um, but what it did was uh, it brought in somebody from outside that had an ear that could listen to both sides and make some suggestions for people to come together. And it, and it worked. Um, the guide that I used for 20 years, he still doesn't talk to me. <laughs> but, you know, welcome to the group, right? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, everybody's licensed and insured and all of the things that, you know, we require in the United States now came out of that. So uh, it was a very good thing for for the guests, um, and it was a very good thing for the lodge owners. Yeah. Great, great, great. The other thing that was going on at the time, there was, uh, you know, you start, spoke about all the development that's going on. I remember there was a number of on water kind of resorts uh, funded by some famous actors and stuff like that that was really controversial. What's happened with that? Well, uh, one of them got completely shut down, and that was uh, the one up on. Um, Blackador. Uh, Blackador Key, one of the finest uh, permit flats uh, in all of Belize. Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio bought the island and was going to develop these uh, condos over the water. And the over the water condos were going to obviously you know, be along the shoreline of the island and it, you know, all hell broke loose and the government even stepped in, even though they had issued the original, original permits to go ahead and do that after so much hell raising by the guides and the people, not only of Belize, but of the United States uh, pulled back from that. Now there's another one that is in controversy right now, and that's on the island of Rosario not far from Blackador, it's a much smaller island, but again, is another premier uh, permit flat 
uh, and they're fighting that tooth and nail, and I hope they're successful. Um, you know, the, the government there is money hungry, like all governments are, but the corruptness of the Belizean government, man, you don't get anything done unless you line the pockets of those guys, and that's just the way it is, and, and they'll say yes, as long as there's enough money involved. Probably no different than any place else. Yeah, yeah. But, so yeah. I mean, if it's not obvious to everybody, um, uh, this guy is is really uh, strong conservations, and of course we've been faced here in Southwest Florida with you know the red tide issue and fighting against the government and the the the, the issues with with uh, discharges from Lake Okeechobee, which flood our estuaries and kill our seagrass and, and, and destroy everything. So we're a small club. We are, right, now we're, yeah. we're, right now we're 67 live members yeah. uh, down from 100 and plus the year before. Yeah. But you know, we've got really engaged people. We've got people that are connected with the right folks. We're heavily connected with organizations that are, are really engaged with, with the issue, you know, Captains for Clean Water and mm -hmm. some others. Um, wh what advice do you, have you got, given your experience, you know, fighting it in Michigan and else, elsewhere, for a small organization to, 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 to engage a larger audience to make change? Great question. Well, uh, first of all, you have to you have to sort out who the de decision makers are. And that's always, that's always the case. Who are the people that, that actually make the decisions for change? And, and then lack of a better term, you know, you got to cozy up to those folks um, and have one, we're going through some, some stuff right here in Michigan right now. Uh, and I've re-engaged. I sat on the, the regulations committee for the Michigan DNR for a long time. Um, and the best advice I can, can give is figure out who your decision makers are. Have a, have a, a, a candid conversation with them about your concerns and about the concerns of your membership. Take your organization and form a coalition with other organizations. Uh, I have a lot of experience in that because uh, we once fought a very big battle here in Michigan and we got our ass handed to us once. We reorganized and got more people involved in the coalition and we went back and, and we, get, we had a victory. So it, it takes bodies uh, it takes cool heads. Uh, it's difficult not to piss people off because of the emotions that everybody has about their favorite activities. And so you have to choose leadership in, the, in these coalitions that have the ability uh, to transmit the message without pissing off those that make the decisions. Department of Natural Resources, no matter whether it's Florida, Michigan, or North Carolina, take ownership in some of their management plans. And those people that have written those management plans defend those fiercely. Um, and it's very difficult, as you are all aware, to make changes when you have that kind of a scenario. We are currently here. Uh, trying to change regulations on the number of steelhead that we can harvest. And the DNR here is hanging their hat on data that is as old as 20 years old because they don't have the data that's newer than that. And some of the folks that are, we finally broke through uh, with, with the Michigan uh, Lake Michigan Basin manager uh, and got through to Jim Dexter, who is our, as you, Tom, probably know, is our chief of fisheries, to start a conversation and to put aside some of these management plans that are now well over 20 years old. And I heard uh, one of your gentlemen speak uh, about 
data and management plans. And the, the thing is, it, as you know, it takes a hell of a long time to put together data to develop a management plan. And by the time that you get all of that put together, conditions have, can change radically. And uh, sometimes the technicians and the biologists are just unwilling to look at people in the field like, like angling groups and guides that are on the water daily. You know, those are the people that really know what the hell are, is going on with fish populations and pollution point sites and all of that sort of stuff. And quite honestly, uh, you know, state governments don't have the funding to send people out there to actually do what they really need to do. So my advice would be set up a coalition. You know, if, if you have, uh, and you're probably already a part of a coalition, but if you're not, I would highly recommend that you do that. Thank you, very good. Anybody have any questions for Ray? Conservation, Belize, saltwater, fly fishing patterns, anything? Uh, to appoint Bob DeVore here. Um, I've been a part of the medical community, which is um, deeply, deeply embedded in tradition and patterns of training versus education and learned an incredible lesson uh, about building databases uh -huh. and databases that and coding structures of data that can actually, instead of just taking only the quantitative lab results, but to take um, a coding, build a coding structure that takes anecdotal information and looks at it over a period of time um, I, your comments about the data and the politics, you know, I could take you into healthcare and you'd feel right at home. But <laughs> one, one of the things that I'm, I, I'm really stimulated by in this conversation, I was recently appointed to the board of the water school um, at the Florida Gulf Coast University, and it's fresh and it's new and it's, it's bringing together not just the scientists, but also the political scientists mm -hmm. and the business people. And, and what I hope to bring to that board is for when I listen to Pete talk about this broad data collection on the whole uh, west coast of Florida, which is so large mm -hmm. that it, it's meaningless because it, it doesn't deal, it, it, they, as he knows better than anybody else, with the subtleties and of the of the geographical conditions that are building. And it's, it's overwhelming for a state agency. But as I listened to your talk and I listened to Pete, I said to myself, wait a minute, we've got a university here in Southwest Florida that has access to really good research and, and they're, they haven't really developed a strategy. Mm -hmm. And we've got our first board meeting coming up um, in sometime in May, and I, I, I'll take conversations with Pete offline and possibly yourself. Yeah, uh, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, because I I think we have a resource to. And one of the things that I've learned in in tackling complex problems is you don't take a big problem, you take a small problem, mm -hmm. and you solve it, and you de demonstrate. And, and one of the other things that you demonstrated tonight and Pete does too all the time is I remember the first time that I reacted to Harvard's database about medical error. And, and somebody said to me, how do you change behavior in a complex environment like healthcare? And I said, oh, it's, in my experience, it's always money uh, and data. And the person who's a world renowned healthcare researcher turned to me and he said, you know, data is, is humans, patients without tears, tell stories. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. Everybody has a series of stories and we learn there how to code those stories and translate it into data as opposed to just anecdotal. anecdotal. Mm -hmm. so this has really stimulated a real energy in me about our first up and coming uh, and, and, and the water school is fresh. 
Yeah. And they're, they're really focused on Southwest Florida. Um, and, and so I, in fact, I want to talk to Pete and Tom some more about some very specific things about data collection. But this has really been, it's been very stimulating. And well, and I, I can I, I, go ahead. A way to capture your experience into, into other than anecdotal stories, because mm -hmm. you have got, as Pete has, or Pete makes these incredible charts of every single day, but it's never aggregated and, and then integrated into the state and the political and the financial structure mm -hmm. in order to stimulate change. So I thank you very much. It's been very well, stimulating. Well, thank you. Uh, one of the challenges <clears throat> that, that I learned, you know, after getting the crap beat out of me and, and some of these, uh, these meetings is it's, it's difficult for scientists and basically, you know, every fisheries biologist, uh, you know, has a degree and uh, it's difficult for them to uh, come to grips with somebody like myself uh, that does not have that scientific degree in biology or, you know, fisheries habitat and uh, to take seriously the folks out there with their feet on the ground. And, and, and that can all be overcome with good relationships and casual conversations that's non-confrontational. Yeah. To, to help each other understand where they're coming from without pissing people off. And that's a big deal. That's a really a big deal because, you know, if you alienate one of these guys as a decision maker, you're done. Your comment about building coalitions mm -hmm. uh, was right on the mark. Good. So Good. if you, you want to challenge, you, you, you take a story into a bunch of really bright Harvard guys Mm -hmm. and, and see how long you can last. <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> and then add to that federal and state officials. Yeah. Uh, so one of the challenges that I, I think the water school is going to have down here in a constructive way is to begin to build a very comprehensive database beginning in Southwest Florida in some very cool. small areas and include the data, the stories, and, and, and get that information out of your head in, into some kind of manageable form as mm -hmm. opposed to just a story. Because sure. really good coders can, can take Pete's dialogue and, and begin to accumulate it and begin to build a database. And we've got the data tools to tackle big data today. Right now it's all government bureaucracy, uh, uh, lobbyist and, and stories, right? Right, and, right. Well, I'm. Th thank you very much for your presentation. <laughs> well, thank you. It's it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. I'd be happy to to visit with uh, you folks more. If there's, you know, if you have more questions, I'm, you know, I'm ready ready to take them. So, so Ray, when you're ready to travel, Gina and I have just bought a second home right next door to our current one. So we'll have a place that you can stay. <laughs> Killer. And uh, like I've, I've, I've got a nice Hell's Bay guide that uh, we can go out on in the, in the, in the sound. And you can see uh, our water firsthand. I'd love it. I'd love it. We're, yeah. uh, we're moving so, towards that. We're double vaccinated now. So okay. yeah, me too. Me too. My, <laughs> Gina, Gina's, Gina's about two weeks away from her second shot. So we're, yeah. we're, we're, we're good to go. Okay. So, so something about Michiganders here. So it was Bob DeVore, who's from, from Indian River, yep. on away. Pete is, uh, is our DNR guy from Michigan. And yep. Chris, cool. I'm a lifetime guy until now. So Yeah. Well, I, it's great to be with you guys. Appreciate the invitation. And uh, hopefully we can visit some more when, uh, you know, you, you've got my number. I do. I do. I will. I will put you and Bob together um, just to chat some more. Sounds um, good. I'll connect you guys. Yeah, Thanks, I Ray, really like so that. much. Give my love to Kate. Um, you know, I, I hope to be up in Michigan uh, probably in the fall. Maybe I'll visit with you guys and that'd be yeah, lovely. And, and some other of my friends up there. And yeah, 
Love to see you guys. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much. All Thanks right, guys. Me. Yeah, bye-bye. Right. Anything else, guys? No, I think that's pretty much it. Anybody okay. got any more ideas or stuff? We can always talk later. All right. Go online, bid often, spend your money, <laughs> tell all your friends. <laughs> that's right. Take care, Stay guys. Tuned. Thank yeah. you. All right. Bye -bye. Good night, all.